Well, hello good and good morning once again to our online service here from King's Christian Centre in Mould, North Wales. We're delighted that you can join us for this service and we pray God's richest blessing over you as you join with us in worshipping, in listening to the word of the Lord and to praying together. Uh, we're going to start by praying, actually, and Liz is going to lead us in that. We thank you, Father God, that whenever and wherever we come to you, you are ready willing and already listening to us. And as we come to you this day, we think of the needs of so many people in our country right now, in all of the United Kingdom, uh, who are grieving because of the loss of our Queen. We thank you for her, for her life, her example, her faith in you and her willingness to speak about that very, very publicly at times. And Father, as we look ahead to the funeral, uh, we know there's going to be more than thousands, millions of people watching. And I just pray, Father God, that you will pour out your spirit on that occasion and that Elizabeth's faith will be so evident that people start to inquire and find you. What a testimony that would be to her reign. And Father, we sing, we, we've sung all through her life, God save our gracious Queen, and we believe you've answered that prayer. And as we start to get used to singing, God save our gracious King, Father, we, we pray for King Charles. And we pray that in amidst all of the grief and the extreme busyness that's on him at the moment, he will have time to look within and speak to you about his loss and about his new role and about his desire, which he's spoken of, to serve the people just as his mother did. Father, that means we want him to have personal faith, to know saving faith. And we come to you and ask that you will work this miracle in his heart. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I would like to uh, read a psalm now for us, uh, written by a king long ago, King David. And it's a psalm that tells of God's grace, his love, his mercy and his compassion. Uh, Psalm 103, so uh, I, I'm blessed every time I read this and I pray that you'll be blessed too as we read it together. Let's go. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass. Like wild flowers, we bloom and die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we'd never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What a great and mighty and wonderful and kind and compassionate and merciful and gracious God we serve and that we love. Uh, now, the service this morning 
is going to be quite a reflective one. Uh, we're going to be looking at the effect of sadness and pressure on our lives as Christians, and Liz will be unpacking that later on. Uh, but we're going to start by enjoying a song together. Uh, now, this song is one that a friend of ours, Laura, introduced us to in our Thursday morning communion service, and it really spoke to me then. And uh, I just pray that it'll speak to you as well. It is called, and I need to look this up to make sure I get it right. It's called The Truth I'm Standing On by Leanne Crawford. Uh, so just sit back, relax. You don't have to join in. Just sit back, relax, and let these words speak to you. And we'll see you on the other side of this song. Scared. Oh, I thought I knew scared. But I'm so filled with fear I can barely move Doubt I've had my share of doubt But never more than right now I'm wondering where are you Here on the edge of Promises find my troubled heart. This is the truth I'm saying. hope you enjoyed that song as much as we did and you, mm. the Lord spoke to you through it. Uh, well, now we're going to turn to God's word. And of course, we want the Lord to speak to us through his word as well, because we know his word is powerful. It's alive. It's active. And uh, if we allow it to, it will sink into our hearts and change us from the inside out. Mm. Uh, Liz will be delivering the word today. So we're just going to pray for her that the God's anointing will be on her and on us as well. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us your word. What a precious treasure that is. 
life-changing, empowering, um, turning us from darkness to light. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we just ask that you'll add the anointing of your spirit to your word today, that Liz's words will come from you, Lord, that she'll be inspired by your spirit, but that also your word and your spirit will combine in our lives, Lord, to bring that mm. harvest of righteousness, that explosion of your kingdom that will make all the difference in our lives and through us to the lives of others. We just submit ourselves to you now, Father, and we look to you, Lord, to fulfil your good plans and purposes in our lives through your word. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start and finish, so there's something for you to look forward to, by reading you the same verse. And it's the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33, and this is what it says. I hope this is Jesus speaking, of course. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. So I want to tell you a story, really. And this happened last Thursday morning, right here in the church. And we were having our Thursday communion. And Laura, who's been mentioned once already today, was leading the time of communion. And she encouraged us before we started just to take a few moments to sit and think about Jesus. She didn't tell us what to think or how to think. She just told us to focus on Jesus. And so I did. And I was amazed that for a couple of minutes only, maybe, I was in a completely different place in my mind than what I was with my body. I was just focusing on Jesus. And what was, came into my mind, which has led to everything I'm going to say today over a couple of days, was just how pressured Jesus must have been as he prepared to go to the cross. Think about him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just think about what he would have been thinking about, what he would have been feeling. Can you do that now like I did? Just shut your room out, shut any people that are around you out and focus on Jesus and think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that in the next hour or so, he was going to be taken prisoner and rough-handled and ill-treated and beaten and whipped and accused and found guilty of something he had not done. And he knew what was coming. More than that, we can look back and went, oh, and think how utterly barbaric it was. And we do. But do we miss what he was feeling at that time? That must have been the most incredible burden on him. And I will, in a moment, read you a few verses, actually, from the Gospels that explain to us what was going on. But in his life, he had pressure too. He wasn't popular with his villagers. He wasn't even popular with all of his family. He certainly wasn't popular with the, the powers that be in the synagogue, the Pharisees and the rabbis. And he was popular with the people who loved him who he helped, who he spoke to, who he stretched out his arms to. But that was just quite a small number of people, really. He lived his life under that glare of hostility. And here he was facing pain and death, separation from his mum and his father who'd brought him up, his disciples who'd followed him faithfully. And ultimately, from his heavenly father, whose will he was carrying out. That must have been a dark moment, you know. And as I thought about that in terms of communion, I remembered that I had listened the night before to part of a, a preach by a gentleman who was talking about anointing, actually. And he said something I'd never thought about and I'm going to share it with you now. I'm sure you've noticed that I've got a bottle of wine here. It's not because I'm thirsty. And a bottle of oil here. And a lovely loaf of bread. Let me tell you why. 
You see, in, in the New Testament in particular, but actually all the way through the Bible, these three things are symbols. And every time we take communion, we use bread and wine to represent the body and the blood of Jesus. And ultimately for his sacrifice, which allowed us to have life eternal. Every time we pray for the sick, we do what it says in the New Testament and anoint them with oil. This is olive oil. And I just want to ask you to think, what do these three things have in common, apart from being in the Bible and being symbols of different things in our Christian life? The oil symbolises the Holy Spirit. The bread symbolises the body of Jesus. And the wine symbolises his blood. So what do they have in common apart from that? Well, this is what this gentleman said. All of these are only here today and are only ever here because of pressure. You see, we have olive oil because they crush the olives till the oil drips out and then they catch it and bottle it. We have wine because the grapes have been crushed till they give up all their juice and all their flavour. And then when it's fermented, we have wine. Or if we don't ferment it, it's grape juice. But that's how we have it. You might think, OK, so bread's the odd one out. Actually, no, it isn't. Because this was growing in a field somewhere a while ago as beautiful wheat. So how did it get into bread? Well, it was crushed between millstones. Stones in the olden days, probably not in our modern mills in quite the same way, but nevertheless... Those corn ears of wheat or corn or whatever cereal you're using have to be completely crushed and ground to fine powder before they're flour, which is what makes the bread. Just flour and water, yeast if you're having risen bread. So how about that? The body of Jesus was pressed and, and, and ground physically by his torturers. We know that his blood flowed. And we know that he was offered oil and vinegar on a sponge and he refused it. But we know that he anointed his body. The women came and did that for him afterwards. Okay. So next time you take communion, think about the pressure that Jesus was under when he went to the cross. And think about the pressure that produces wine and bread and oil, which to us are still very much symbols of what the power of God can produce in our lives. Healing, salvation. It's great, isn't it? So, pressure. Just let me read you a couple of verses that I am sure you will know from the Gospels about what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane. Interestingly enough, and I'll take them in chronological order as we find them in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Matthew 26, just one verse, verse 38. This is Jesus. No, I'm going to go back to 37. Jesus was in the olive grove called Gethsemane and his disciples were with him. And he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, slightly away from everybody else and he became anguished and distressed and he told them my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death stay here and keep watch with me mark 14 verses 33 and 4 say identical things these people were patently there and it was written on their hearts and in their minds forever. He took Peter and James and John with him and he became deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And in both of these um, readings, we find out what happens next. He cries out to his father, Abba which is Hebrew for daddy, father. He cried out loud, 
everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Luke tells it like this. And Luke, remember, wrote his Gospels after talking with eyewitnesses. And he picks this up in verse 41 of Luke 22. And he says this in 42. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yes, I want your will to be done, not mine. The same as in Matthew and Mark. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. He certainly was tortured physically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually. It wasn't just the pain of the cross that he was facing. Now the Gospel of John doesn't give us any of that narrative about the Garden of Gethsemane. But he gives us a lot more detail about the Passover. Do you remember in John chapter 13, the washing of the disciples' feet? John chapter 14 is that wonderful chapter about, if I go, I will come again, I will go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and take you to be with me. John 15 is the verse about the vine and the branches. John 16 is Jesus talking to them about the Holy Spirit. And I, I thought about this this morning and I thought, so we've got the Last Supper and then we've got four glorious chapters of Jesus teaching his disciples. This was the last time he was with them in this way and he gave them some remarkable things to take home and think about and we're still doing that today. These are some of the favourite chapters of most of us, I think, Certainly for me, but I think John 17 comes out on the top because this, at this point, Jesus stopped teaching and he prayed. And we call it the high priestly prayer. There's a few verses here, but I am going to take the time to read it to you. So we've had four chapters or however long it took of all of that amazing teaching. And after saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. You can almost hear the longing in his voice, can't you? I have revealed to you the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message that you gave me. They accepted it and they know that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. Is this true for you as well? Verse 9. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in the world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave. So I'll just read that again. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost, except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures told. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things when I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them 
because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them, so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Of course, that was by the Holy Spirit. And after that, he went out into the olive grove and was arrested. I asked a friend of mine who recently came to know, know the Lord in this church, praise God for that, to read this chapter because she's finding the Bible very exciting and I, I wasn't sure whether she'd ever read it. And then I asked her to tell me what impacted her. She's given me permission to read this to you. This is what she said to me. For me, it's simple. The timeless message of how much Jesus loves us. It's incredible just how much love Jesus had. And it's so evident in this chapter. Jesus loved those who believed in him because they witnessed him. Now, you could argue that that's easy. He loved those that believed because they heard of him through the testimony of those that witnessed him. Again, that's plausible. And he loves those that will continue to believe in him through discipleship and the scripture. And that is harder. And therefore Jesus recognised this and really wanted us to know how much he loves us. He loved us so much that he prayed to his Father in heaven for us, for those he knew and for those he didn't know. He knew the perse persecution we all face for declaring our belief in him. It still happens today. But what a reminder that we are not of this world. We are destined for a better one because of his plea to God for us to be with him. His love for us is just incredible. It's eternal. It's profound. And what's more, it's because of the demonstration of this love by Jesus that we start to comprehend the kind of love that Jesus has for us. That kind of love where God loved Jesus before the world began. Like that's just insanely incomprehensible. So through Jesus, we start to get a glimpse, a human understanding of the magnitude and capacity of God's love. We will never fully understand or realise it because we're human. But Jesus bridges that gap between us and God to help us to begin to comprehend and understand it. Isn't that amazing? I was bowled over by that late last night. Just think about that for a few minutes. Jesus is the bridge between God and you. We know what it cost him. We know what he went through. Just think about that for a moment. So right now, I want to ask you to think. Think back. Look at the past, the present, possibly even the future. 
and ask you what has caused the greatest pressure in your life? Not detail, not names, but what human experience has given you the most pain? How and I talked about this before, and we concluded that most of the things that have given us the most grief, when you look at them and as an experience, not as people or things that have happened, but how it made you feel, that it all comes down to loss. Loss of relationship, whether that's because of somebody dying. Loss of relationship because somebody's no, not, no longer in your life for any other number of reasons, like move to the other side of the world. That happens. Maybe people have changed jobs and you're not with them day in, day out anymore. Changing schools is a big one. Going away to university. People leaving your church. People falling out with you and even neighbours never speaking to you again. Jesus knew about this. Do you remember the story of Lazarus? It's got that famous two-word verse in it. Jesus wept. He understood how that felt. And that's why we can talk to him about it now. I'm just going to give you three little verses that explain that. Two are from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Do you remember the story of the temptations? Jesus was under a lot of pressure there. He could have clicked his fingers and changed the whole thing. That was as God. As a human, he had to go through it. It was part of learning what this was all about, his father's commission. Jesus is our high priest. And Hebrews 12, wonderful chapter, starts verse 2 like this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Probably that's true for most of us here. We haven't yet got to that. Some people have, of course. There's amazing stories of the martyrs and the disciples who all came to very unpleasant deaths because they were following Jesus. But for us, listening to this today, I think that's probably true. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I know that you all know Isaiah 53 really well. But this explains to us, way back in the history of, of the people of Israel, prophetically, because God knows what's going to happen well ahead of time. And here and there, he gives us little glimpses. And this is one of those. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. There's a lot to think about there, isn't there? It's tough, but you know, it's also very comforting because it means we can go to Jesus when things are hard, when things hurt, when we feel crushed and broken. 
he does know what it's like. And the people who know what it's like are the best people to comfort us. I'm sure you know that in human terms. This morning, Howard and I had a very unexpected start to our day because we had to get up early and rush to go and take somebody to hospital. Um, and as we were coming, driving back, I was thinking about finding your way to places. Um, and the things we use in these days versus how it was when I was a child to find your way around. And I was thinking, well, you've got your sat-nav, you've got Google Maps, you've got your phone, your ever-present phone. And if you're going somewhere that you've never been before, the chances are the place you're going to has given you directions. It might be a person, it might be a shop, it might be um, a museum. But somebody will have put the information where you need it for when you go. But it doesn't always work out like that, does it? We quite often get it wrong. Um, I can, I'm not going to tell you all how many times Howard and I have got lost following sat-navs in various parts of the world. So think about a situation where maybe you're going not that far away, but to a place you haven't been before. And somebody has sent you directions and said, so you've got your directions, I'll see you at three o'clock. Okay. And you get in the car and you've got your directions and you've got your sat-nav and you've put it all in and you get to the place and the sat-nav's going, you have reached your destination, but it's not the right place. Has that ever happened to you? Hmm, it happened to me. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, one solution at that point is to ring up the person who sent you the directions. Particularly if you're going on a holiday and you've never been there before. And you go, excuse me, this is, and I, you sent me directions and I'm lost. Can you help? Now then, pause button. What's the first thing they're going to say to you? Think about it. I bet it's... Oh, right, let me help. Where are you now? Because there needs to be a point of reference before they can direct you. However far it is or however far it isn't, you might just have to turn around and it's right behind you. That's happened before now as well. Where are you now? So that you can get the help you need to get to your destination. And as I thought about that, I thought, that's exactly like our human journey, isn't it? We need help, we need instructions, we need a map, we need directions. And of course, we find all those in the word of God, his holy word, the truth that changes us. We don't always understand though, and the Bible's a big book, sometimes we can't find the bits we need. Well, I've got a solution for you. Ask somebody. And they may not say, where are you now? But if you have an honest conversation with them about what's going on in your heart, in your life, how you feel, how unhappy you are, how much pain you're in, they're going to say, I want to help you. Let's sit down and talk about this. Did you know that Jesus is the bridge between this life and God? Did you know that the cross is that bridge between heaven and hell? Did you know that if you just talk to him, he'll listen and answer? Did you know that it says in the Bible, taste and see that the Lord is good? Did you know that it says in the Bible, God's soul of the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life? So my question this morning is, where are you now? And I'm going to read you that verse we started with. Jesus said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Amen. Well, thank you, Liz. That was a really powerful word. And uh, we're going to pray into some of those things that you talked mm. about now. Uh, so perhaps you'd care to join us 
uh, in a brief time of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you today and we just want to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you didn't turn your back on the suffering that you faced when you went to the cross. Lord, we know that you were described as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we know that you did that for us, Lord. And Lord, we love you. We put our trust in you and we just want to praise you and bless you and thank you for that decision that you made in Gethsemane when you said, not my will, but yours be done. You could have turned your back on us, Lord, and abandoned us. You could have saved yourself, but you didn't. You chose the path of suffering, mm -hmm. went to the cross. And yet, Lord, we know that it was because of the joy that was set before you that you endured the cross, endured the shame. And now you're seated at the right hand of God on high, enthroned in glory and splendour. And you are seeing, Lord, the fruits of what you've been through, the fruits of your suffering in the lives of those who put their trust in you. Lord, we just lift your name on high. We lift you on high, Lord Jesus, because you have done it. You're the lion of the tribe of Judah who triumphed, mm -hmm. but you're also the lamb who was slain. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we bless you and praise you this morning. And we give you glory, Lord, in your own precious name. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we remember that you said to us many times from the Old Testament all the way through to almost the end of the New Testament, in various ways, you promised that you would never leave us, that you would never forsake us, you would never turn your back on us. So Father, as we come to you today and confess our weariness at times and the pain that this life is on occasions, we thank you that you are there with your promise, which is firm and will stand. That because Jesus went through it first, we can have confidence that these words hold that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Jesus went through the forsaking so that we could be secure today. Thank you, Father. And yes, Lord. We know in ourselves and we know of other believers and friends and family members that we have, Lord, who are going through suffering at this time. Lord, we thank you that even when we do suffer, we are not abandoned by you, but you draw close to us, Lord. You hold us up. You remember that we are frail. You remember that we are dust. And because of all the things you've been through, Lord Jesus, you're able to get alongside and help us. Lord, we just pray, I just pray for my brothers and sisters who I know, Lord, who are suffering at the moment with chronic ill health, uh, with family issues, with all sorts of pressures and strains, Lord, that are coming against them. And I pray that you, Lord, will strengthen them by your Holy Spirit, that you'll give them your joy as their strength, Lord, the same joy that saw you triumph mm -hmm. over sin and hell and death. Lord, please lift up these precious brothers and sisters of ours who are going through the mill at the moment. But we know, Lord, that pressure causes that oil to flow. Mm -hmm. It causes that wine to flow. It causes that grain to be ground into useful flour that can be made into something that nourishes and sustains. So, Father, thank you that nothing that we go through in this world is ever wasted. Mm -hmm. No bad experience, no pressure, no suffering that we have is ever wasted in your economy. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, it's, it adorns us, Lord, because it, it's, it, it brings out the aroma of Christ in us. Mm -hmm. But Lord, we do lift up, Lord, those who are suffering today and pray for your grace, your mercy, your love and your blessing over their lives in the precious name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. And as we close this time, I just want to remind you of something else Jesus said to his disciples and the people listening to him one day when he was walking on earth. He said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that this promise remains. And we come to you and ask that you will take our weariness and our burdens. And as we think about this country 
on Monday on the funeral of Elizabeth II. Lord, we pray that you will draw close particularly to her family and the people who have worked for her for such a long time, who, who genuinely care for her, for her people who have known any other sovereign. Lord, that they would remember that her faith was in you and hear your voice saying to them, as the Queen did, come unto me and I will give you rest. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our final song now and uh, there was only one song that we could actually put in at this point of the service. Uh, that old hymn, it is well with my soul, mm. uh, but sung very beautifully in a cappella. So please uh, think, uh, think about the words as they're sung and join in if you wish. Mm. Bless you. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when so like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. my 
Here we are at the end of yet another online service from King's. We pray that you've been blessed, um, maybe not in the, the usual way this week, but um, in a more sort of thoughtful and, and deep way than maybe sometimes we do. Um, if you'd like to come and see us in person, that would be great. Uh, we have our normal Sunday morning service at 10.30 here in the chapel uh, in Mould. Uh, but if you can't make it on Sunday, then you'd be very welcome to join us for communion, uh, a much more quiet and contemplative time at 10.30 on Thursdays. And of course, if you're miles and miles away and you can't join us at all in, re in, in real life, you're always welcome to join us online and check out our website for more details. So Liz, you have a, a word for us to finish. I'm just going to read two little phrases from the prayer that Jesus prayed over us. I find it incredible that Jesus prayed this for you and me in this day. He said this, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you, Father, sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. We just thank you, Father, and pray that it may be so, even as your son prayed it. Amen. Amen. We shall see you next week. Have a blessed week. <laughs>